So, uh, can you all hear me? Okay, good. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the semester and for uh, uh, offering me this, uh, uh, so graciously offered me this opportunity to be here, both in Marseille and then subsequently in Paris. It's uh, for me a great honor to be here and uh, uh, thank you, uh, the organizers, very much for the invitation. So, uh, I will uh, uh, start my lecture in a, a very uh, soft way. I will uh, work out probably a few examples. Uh, I want to thank Ludovic very much for uh, introducing a good part of my lecture, in fact. And uh, so, what I uh, want to discuss, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I want to start with a very simple example, that uh, apparently very simple example, that comes from uh, the physics of uh, semi-flexible polymers. You know, a polymer is an elastic material uh, whose uh, <coughs> structure is made of chains and uh, in the physics of uh, semi-flexible polymers there is uh, a, an equation that uh, shows up that uh, <coughs> goes back to a beautiful visionary work of Manfort. Uh, there is a little paper by Manfort, 1995. in which he discusses the following equation. So I will denote this operator with M for Manfort. And uh, the operator is uh, this one. So let's take uh, dd theta plus uh, uh, cosine theta ddy plus uh, sine theta. <coughs> uh, well, let's put here ddx, ddy minus ddt. So this is the Manford operator, <coughs> and uh, this Manford operator is at the basis of what is known nowadays as the rototranslation group. Okay, so Manford uh, uh, came up with this operator, and there are various generalizations of it. In fact, in the physics of polymers, uh, there is a three a higher dimensional model that is attached to this operator, which uh, uh, I will probably describe later on. So Manford came up with this operator in uh, his discussion of uh, Euler's elastica. It was subsequently realized that this operator plays a crucial role in the physics of, uh, uh, for instance, semi-flexible polymers. And there are some fundamental problems in the description of semi-flexible polymers that go back to understanding precisely the global behavior of the fundamental solution as associated with this operator here. So this is an evolution operator that I will uh, discuss a little bit. So let, let me start with the, uh, the language that was introduced by, uh, by Ludovic. So let me call dd theta the vector field uh, uh, x1. And let me call x0 the vector field cosine theta ddx. Uh, plus sine theta ddy minus ddt. So uh, we can think of this operator as based on R4. So with coordinates theta, x, y, and t. Of course, uh, the real meaning of theta is that uh, the point sine, cosine theta, sine theta runs over the unit circle in R2, so you can think of uh, the uh, space as really uh, the unit circle crossed uh, by R3. So uh, these two uh, vector fields, of course, do not generate all of R4, but if we start looking at commutators of these vector fields, so for instance X1, we take the commutator of x1 with x0. Uh, Ludovic has, of course, introduced uh, you know, all these notions, so I will take them for granted at this point. But in any case, you know, this is the first order vector fields 
given by this object here. So you see that uh, when we act with this uh, object over this, we get uh, minus sine theta d d x plus cosine theta d d y, and all the other pieces they cancel in the commutation operation. Okay. So if we take, uh, let's call this uh, vector field x2 for simplicity for a moment. And then let's uh, uh, iterate commutation. So let's do now, let's call x3 the vector field that we get taking a commutator of x2 <coughs> with x0. So uh, again, now, or if you wish, let's, let's take uh, uh, x1 with x2. Okay? So if we keep commuting, so now we get, uh, here we get uh, minus cosine theta ddx, and then here we get minus sine theta ddy. And now it's an easy exercise at this point to realize, to recognize, that if you look at the, uh, the span of uh, x0, x1, x2, and x3, this is r4 at every point. It's a very simple exercise in linear algebra. Okay, so that tells us uh, that uh, uh, the two vector fields, x1 and x0, along with their commutators given here, generate the whole tangent space in the language which was introduced by Ludovic. Okay? So this is an example, it's a first a simple example, uh, Manford, it's a simple example of uh, this wild uh, class of uh, differential operators of order two, which was introduced by Ludovic in his lecture, which is called the class of Ormander type. <coughs> Vector fields. So let me uh, recall uh, the theorem of Ormander. It was already uh, stated by uh, Ludovic in his lecture. So, uh, uh, I will introduce a definition. So, let's suppose, I will uh, just uh, uh, place my discussion in, uh, for simplicity in uh, N. Everything that uh, I am saying uh, holds uh, without any changes in a connected Riemannian manifold, M, as Ludovic has already uh, illustrated. So let's suppose that we have uh, a collection of uh, M <coughs> smooth vector fields. So these are uh, C infinity vector fields in, let's say, Rn. So we say that uh, they satisfy the finite rank, finite rank condition and Ludovic has given many uh, other uh, denominations for this condition here, but uh, uh, once I talked to Ormander about it, and Ormander got very touchy about the fact that I did not call it Ormander's condition. So he went into a lengthy explanation of why it should be called Ormander's condition. Nonetheless, I think that this condition actually was in the literature, certainly was known to Caratheodori at the beginning of 1900, okay? And uh, uh, there is a, it was known to Elie Eli Cartan, uh, it was known uh, to, of course, uh, uh, the, the Chow theorem and Rasheski's theorem is based on this condition. But Caratheodori had a pretty good idea of this condition, okay? So let uh, uh, x1, xm be a system of C-infinity vector fields in Rn. They satisfy the finite rank condition if the rank of the Lie algebra generated by them is n at every point. So this means that uh, at every point, the vector fields plus a sufficiently high number of their commutators span the whole tangent space. So I will not insist too much on this condition because it has been uh, already uh, illustrated by Ludovic this morning. 
So, and the fundamental theorem of Ormander, so Ormander proved uh, this fundamental result. Before I state Ormander's result, let me also introduce a, recall a definition for everybody's sake here. Uh, I assume that uh, we all come from different directions in mathematics, so there are some people who are uh, best versed in one thing and uh, rather than another. So I will just introduce a few definitions to make uh, our uh, uh, ground common in a, in a way, uniform. So, uh, small definition here. So, so, suppose we have a partial differential. So, let's suppose this is a partial differential operator operator with, uh, let's say, smooth coefficients. Uh, otherwise, this definition does not make much sense. So we say that this operator is hypoelliptic in an open set omega. So P is hypoelliptic. Hypoelliptic in uh, omega open subset of Rn if uh, any distributional solution, so suppose that we have uh, two distributions, uh, u and f, such that p of u is equal to f, so u and f are distributions in omega, uh, then, so for any two such distribution, then uh, u is uh, c infinity in little omega if f is uh, c infinity in little omega, wherever little omega relatively open sub, relatively compact subset of capital omega is. So this is the definition of a hypoellipticity of a differential operator. And uh, there are uh, some very famous examples of such operators. So the uh, first and foremost example is, of course, Laplace's operator in Rn. So this operator uh, is uh, the most fundamental example of uh, a hypoelliptic operator. Uh, the hypoellipticity of this operator is usually known as uh, uh, Wilde's lemma, which uh, appeared in a famous paper by Hermann Weil, 1940, uh, I must say, being Italian, that uh, this denomination is incorrect in since uh, Weil's lemma was in fact proved uh, earlier than Weil's by Renato Cacciopoli. So it should be called the Cacciopoli. Cacciopoli proved uh, uh, the same lemma in uh, 1938 and uh, <coughs> Uh, and then uh, a student of Cacciopoli, Gianfranco Cimino, generalized the Weil's lemma to differential operators with variable coefficients in R3 two years later. And then Weil proved this famous Weil's lemma, which was already been established by Cacciopoli uh, a few years later. So we should call it the cacciopoli cimino Weil's lemma. And in fact, um, if you look at the monograph of Carlo Miranda on uh, elliptic differential equation, you will find this denomination there. So, uh, so the, this is uh, the first and foremost example. And then there is, of course, another famous example, which is the heat equation in Rn plus 1. That is also hypoelliptic, although it has a very striking difference f with the Laplacian. The Laplacian is real analytic hypoelliptic in the sense that this property here not only holds when the distribution little f is c infinity, but it also holds when the distribution little f is real analytic. So if you take distributional solutions of this equation, then U is real analytic wherever the right hand side is real analytic. Okay? So this is true for the Laplacian, but this property is not true for the heat equation. The heat equation is hypoelliptic, but not real analytic hypoelliptic. And this difference is quite important. So then there are operators which are not uh, 
hyperelliptic. And one simple operator that uh, uh, you can think of is, uh, for instance, uh, the wave equation. So if you take another famous example from PDEs, the wave equation in Rn plus 1, this operator is not hyperelliptic. It fails miserably to be hyperelliptic because uh, solutions even of uh, heat equation, uh, wave equation equal to zero, they do not gain as much, as, as much regularity as uh, the right hand side. So there is a phenomenon of loss of derivatives for that equation, which is not true for these two models here. All right, so um, why am I talking about hyperelliptic operators? Of course, I was talking about Ormander, so there must be some connection between these two things. Now, let me see. So, in order for this to go up, uh, uh -huh, they don't work simultaneously. No. So, let me push this back first. What am I doing? Sorry. Uh, I can always blame the jet lag. This is going down by itself. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I see. So this is like Italy. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> it's reassuring. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is much easier. So uh, here is Ormander's. Uh, uh, the so this is the celebrated Ormander's hypolysticity theorem. Ormander proved that uh, uh, if x1, xm are C infinity vector fields in Rn and satisfy the finite rank condition, Then, oh, let's uh, also put here, uh, let me start with, uh, to keep consistency with the example I started from, let's take uh, m plus 1 vector fields, and let's also put here uh, c, which is a c infinity function in omega, or then the operator L formed in this way sum j from uh, 0 to m of xj, <coughs> j from 1 to m, xj squared plus x0 plus c is hyperelliptic. So the finite rank condition is a sufficient condition for hyperellipticity of a very wild family of operators made up in this way. Notice that uh, this family of operators not only includes this model here, but it also trivially includes this model. Okay? Because it's enough to take xj equal ddxj and they take x0 to be minus ddt and then, of course, nc identically equal to zero. And then, of course, you know, this operator will lead to the heat equation in Rn. Okay, so, of course, that uh, uh, special form of the operator does not and should not include models like this. Okay, so this is the celebrated hypolipticity theory of Ormander. Uh, I should say that Ormander already in his PhD thesis in 1954 uh, with Lars Garding had already proved the necessary condition for uh, hypolipticity. So uh, if you look at Ormander's paper, you will see that the finite rank condition is not only sufficient but also almost necessary for hyperelliptic. So it's very close to uh, completely close the circle on the fundamental issue of the hyperelliptic. All right. <coughs> so 
Oh, that's a, that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, there, uh, there are known higher order hyperliptic uh, operators. Take powers of the Laplacian. You take any power of the Laplacian, it's hyperliptic. Okay? Uh, at least, uh, their powers of the Laplacian are hyperliptic. However, uh, when you go to this uh, general framework here, and this, I will discuss this, uh, so, so let me postpone uh, answering your question to when I start talking about uh, Carnot groups. Okay? So this is a very fundamental question, and if you go in the general uh, setting of Carnot groups, the question of uh, uh, apolyticity or real analytic apolyticity of higher order operators is completely, uh, it's a terra incognita at this moment. Okay, so, <coughs> so let me go back for a moment uh, to the operator of Manford. And... Uh, So, since the operator of Manford can be written, uh, of course, as you see it from, uh, from what is written here, M can be written as x1 squared plus x0, where uh, x1 and x0 are those vector fields over there. And since we have already established that those two vector fields satisfy Hormander's finite rank condition, then uh, this operator is hyperliptic. According to Ormander's theorem. Okay? So there is also much more that goes on with this operator. There is a group structure under which this operator becomes uh, a left translation invariant. So in this group structure, I can simplify it like this. So let me identify uh, the coordinates there, as you see, are x, y, t. And then there is this theta, which uh, plays a special role. So I'm going to identify now x plus i, y with x, y. And then when I identify it with a complex number, I will call it z. Can everybody read the, my characters here? So uh, you can all read in the back there. Okay, good. So I if there is a problem, please tell me. I will try to uh, uh, enlarge my characters. So with this identification, uh, we can introduce uh, uh, a certain group law. So I will write it theta zt composed with theta prime, z prime, t prime. And this is, uh, as you can surmise, standard translation in theta. This means multiplication on the circle. And then we have uh, z plus e i theta. <coughs> z, pr z prime and t plus t prime. OK, so you can check that this is uh, a non-commutative group law. Okay, and uh, if we look at uh, R four, in doubt with the, this non-commutative group law, then we are get uh, uh, a Lie group, or if you wish, you know. <coughs> so this becomes a Lie group, whose Lie algebra. I will, inter I will denote it like this, little m still for Manford, but RT now stands for rototranslation. Why rototranslation? Look at this uh, uh, operation, group operation. It's a translation in theta, uh, it's a translation in Z, I'm sorry, followed by a rotation. Okay, so for this reason it's called the rototranslation group. Ludovic, how did you manage not to be pulled by this thing? Because this is a kind of guillotine. Every time I raise my head like this, it pulls me back. So, uh, so the rototranslation is uh, the Lie algebra generated by the two vector fields. 
x1, x0, and x1, which I've written up there. Okay? And so uh, we, get, uh, we get this uh, group structure here. And it's very easy. It's an easy exercise that I will uh, leave for you to check. So let's see. To check that the two vector fields x0 and x1 are uh, left invariant with respect to those translations. So, so x0 and x1 are invariant to the left. I will make precise this thing with respect to the translation which has been introduced there. Okay, so uh, in fact, you know, we we could uh, uh, we could write points G uh, uh, as theta x y t and G prime as theta prime, x prime, y prime, t prime, and then introduce uh, the operator of left translation by, like, by this. So G com composed with G prime. So this is going to be my left translation. And we can check <coughs> that uh, the two vector fields are uh, invariant so that if we take both x0, so j equals 0 and 1, then xj of lg f, f is a given function, is equal to lg of xj f, where f is a function from uh, r4 to the real, and it's smooth. Oh, of course, lg f is the new function defined in this way. Okay? So it's a simple exercise to check that uh, the two vector fields x0 and x1 are left invariant with respect to translation, and therefore also the Manford operator. Therefore, also Manford has this property. Since Manford is given by uh, x1 squared plus x0, so both operators' differential vector fields are invariant under translation, so Manford also has this property. Okay, so we have uh, uh, we have this situation right now. We have recognized that this operator Manford has a Lie group structure behind it, okay, and that with respect to that Lie group structure, the operator is invariant with respect to the group operations. Okay, very good. Why am I talking about these things? Well, it will take us a little while before uh, uncovering this whole thing. So, but uh, let me also say one thing. We, let's, it's important that we observe that. Uh, uh, the rototranslation algebra is not nilpotent. Aha, there is a new word now here on the blackboard. So nilpotent means that uh, after you, oh, they told me not to go out of the boundaries, here. that after you take a, a sufficiently large number of commutators, you get to the trivial vector space, so which is the zero element of the Lie algebra. Okay, so you can see very simply that if you keep taking, because of cosine theta and sine theta there in the uh, definition of the vector fields, if you keep taking commutators, you will net, never kill them. Okay, you will net, never get to the zero vector field. Okay, so this algebra is not nilpotent. So as we will see, this lack of nilpotency of the Lie algebra is connected to lack of uh, uh, a homogeneous structure 
in this Lie group. So this is somehow related. I'm going to do this, okay, but this is not an equivalence. It's related to the lack of homogeneous structure. And although this is still a little bit of a foggy uh, definition, but a homogeneous structure is connected to the presence of dilations. We know that in Rn we have dilations, okay? And we also know that the standard differential operators of mathematical physics are invariant in a sense uh, which is easily specified with respect to these dilations. Uh, the Manford operator does not have this uh, uh, nice property. So there are uh, the, the Lie algebra is not nilpotent and there are not dilations attached to it. All right, so this looks like a bad luck. We cannot do anything with it. Well, let me uh, continue the discussion because uh, this will lead us to the introduction <coughs> of uh, another set of uh, geometrical objects which uh, uh, play a very important role in this uh, uh, business here. Okay, So uh, let me pull back to another visionary little paper. 1934, Kolmogorov published a small paper of a few pages on the kinetic theory of gases and connection of interpretation of kinetic theory of gases in terms of Brownian motion. So this was Kolmogorov. <laughs> he, he published a small paper uh, in which he gave uh, a model for uh, his interpretation of collisions between uh, gas molecules and uh, he came up with an equation, so he wrote an equation, a partial differential equation. There is going to be a partial differential operator, which I'm going to denote for, uh, with K in homage to Kolmogorov. Okay? Uh, he did not call it K, of course. KU is the operator uh, dx square u plus x dyu uh, minus dtu. And Kolmogorov's equation is uh, this differential operator equated to zero. All right, so why am I talking about Kolmogorov? I've started with Manford, now I'm talking about Kolmogorov, and there was this Earl Manders class in between. Well, um, let's see. Kolmogorov's equation, of course, I mean, I can write the vector field x1 equal ddx and uh, x2, x0 equals x ddy minus ddt. And clearly, Kolmogorov's operator is just x1 squared plus x0. So definitely, uh, Kolmogorov's equation fits into the general description of uh, operators of Ormander's class. And it's very simple to check that if we take the commutator between x1 and x0, then when I hit with ddx, this guy here, I get ddy, and every other uh, second order term cancels in the commutation. Remember, this is x1, x0, minus x0, x1. So you have to take uh, partials in this direction first, and then uh, subtract partials in this direction first, and you see that there is only one which is, does not vanish, is when you hit with x1, uh, this guy here. So this is just ddy. So you see that uh, uh, if you take uh, x1, x0, and uh, x1 commutator with x0, and you take the span of these three vector fields, you generate the whole tangent space at every point. Okay? Is it? Just write the determinant of this three vector field. So the, you have uh, 1, 0, 0. You have 0, x minus 1. 0, x minus 1. And then you have uh, 0, 1, 0. 
take the determinant of this. <coughs> this is different from zero at every point, right? Okay. So that means that uh, the span of these three vector fields at every point is R3, and therefore K is of Hormander type. It's a Hormander type operator. And therefore hyperelliptic. In fact, if you look at Hormander celebrated paper, it does open with the discussion of Kolmogorov's operator. It's the main motivation in Ormander's paper for his uh, fundamental result. It starts off with the discussion of Kolmogorov's operator, uh, and then uh, he goes on to find, uh, in terms of uh, uh, algebraic conditions on the matrices, he writes a generalization of Kolmogorov's equation, and he finds out, in terms of algebraic conditions on the matrices of this generalization, a necessary and sufficient condition for uh, hyperlipticity in terms of his theorem. So, uh, it is quite remarkable that back in 1934, Kolmogorov had already proved uh, the hyperlipticity of his operator much, much earlier than Ormander, because uh, using the method of characteristic and Fourier transform, Kolmogorov had actually computed an explicit fundamental solution for his equation. So, uh, back in 1934, Kolmogorov found explicit fundamental solution for uh, of k. And this fundamental solution, you look at it and you see that it's infinity outside of the diagonal. So then the operator is hyperelliptic. Any time that uh, a partial differential operator with smooth coefficients as a fundamental solution which is infinity outside of the diagonal, then you can show easily by methods of fun functional analysis that it is hyperelliptic. So therefore, Kolmogorov had already proved without, of course, this huge theorem that is Ormander's theorem, the hyperellipticity of his own operator. All right, uh, why am I talking about uh, Kolmogorov's equation in uh, a connection with uh, Manford? Well, if we look at uh, the operator of Manford, uh, let's see, how can I... Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we look at uh, Kolmogorov's equation and we compare it with the operator of Manford, they don't look like at all. There is a, you know, apparent striking discrepancy between these two operators. However, people in probability had long realized that, uh, in fact, this goes back to fu fundamental work of Mark Katz, that uh, th there is a connection between the operator of Kolmogorov and uh, the operator of Manford. And the connection is given through trying to find, and so now this is the key word and I'm getting into the heart of my lecture, trying to find some kind of uh, approximating structure for the operator of Manford that on the level of the Lie algebra mimics exactly what happens with Rn, or if you wish, with the tangent space of uh, a smooth manifold. So, um, there is lack of uh, nilpotency for Manford. There is lack of homogeneous structure, as I have pointed out down here. However, there is a family of approximating operator for Manford that uh, kind of uh, make justice to this lack, and uh, I want to discuss them now. Uh, are there questions? Mm -hmm. 
So let me talk a little bit about approximating Mumford with Kolmogorov. So let's go back. Mumford operator is this one. And we have seen that uh, the two vector fields uh, have, uh, you know, a group structure behind them, which is not nilpotent. So here is an idea, uh, which is uh, apparently a very simple idea, but quite far reaching. And uh, I will discuss this idea in a much greater generality. It goes back to a visionary program that was uh, laid down by Eli Stein at his uh, address at the 1970 International Congress of Mathematicians in Nice. So, um, the idea is the following. Okay, so we have this operator. It's a, it looks like a bad operator because we keep taking commutators. Okay, we know it generates the Lie algebra, but what do we do with it? In analysis, there are two fundamental operations, right? There is translations and dilations. And with translations and dilation, we build up whole harmonic analysis in Rn. So Eli Stein, in 1970, laid down a program that uh, uh, is based on this very naive idea, which I'm kind of illustrating. And uh, he said, well, suppose we can take uh, a uh, Suppose that we can associate with a given differential operator a nilpotent structure. And suppose that uh, uh, in this nilpotent structure we can also associate with this nilpotent structure a homogeneous structure, some kind of dilations. Then we can develop harmonic, non commutative harmonic analysis. In other words, we can reduce the study of boundary value problems for uh, differential operators associated uh, with this family of vector fields to boundary value problems on the boundaries of certain domains, okay? like we do with Rn. So, uh, and now this is uh, the idea that I want to illustrate a little bit. <coughs> So, we have this uh, uh, Manford operator. So, the idea is to uh, approximate uh, x1 and x0 uh, uh, at second order. With Taylor, with Taylor expansions. So what do I mean by why second order? Why don't I want to approximate to first order? Why don't I want to approximate to fifth order? Well, let's go back for a, sec for a second to Manford. So we have the vector fields. Then we have their first commutators. I could think of the vector fields as first commutators. Then we have commutators of order two, commutators of order three. This is already a commutator. So I have commutators of order three, and I generate the whole Lie algebra. So the idea is to approximate the vector fields to order three minus one. That means second order. That's why this, where this comes from. Why don't I want to approximate with commutators uh, to order uh, four? because it will be totally useless. As you see, the commutation operation will destroy that approximation. It's irrelevant. The only approximation which is relevant here is the one of order two. So I will write now these two new vector fields. I'm sorry for using the same notations that I'm using here. Uh, if you wish, you can switch. You can call this y1 and the other one y0, but it's convenient to have uh, this notation. I will write x1 ddx, so in this uh, change now, the theta has become x. I'm sorry for this, but I don't want to make the notation very heavy. Okay, so the theta has become x, and then I have uh, x, x0 equal to x squared over 2 dy plus <coughs> x dz minus dt. And then I look at the operator L given by x1 squared plus x0. And I say that this is uh, my approximating operator. So this is uh, 
approximating operator for Manford. Uh, I've done a few changes here. So you, you take the expansion of cosine theta and sine theta. That's what I'm doing. I'm taking Taylor expansion of cosine theta and sine theta at the second order. I'm writing down the original vector fields. I'm replacing the original vector fields with the one that I obtained by replacing cosine theta and sine theta with their expansion, Taylor expansions of order two. Okay, then I change the name to the variables, so the theta has become x, and consequently the x, the y, and whatever, they have, been, they have changed. And uh, so you see there is a z, that has, now the z is the y there, and the y is the x. This is the theta, okay? So after I do this, I realize that there is this new family of vector fields, okay? So there are these two vector fields here, which are approximating vector fields for Manford. And you can recognize easily that the Lie algebra, as it should be, of course, right? Why am I doing all of this otherwise? That the Lie algebra generated by uh, uh, x0, x1, uh, x1, uh, and uh, x0, and x1, x1, x0 is R4. Of course, you know, this should be a good approximating operator for Manford. So then uh, this vector, uh, this operator here is of Ormander type. And it's hyperliptic. And its connection with Manford is that this operator is, if you wish, the approximating, at the level of the Lie algebra, the approximating operator of Manford. So everything that we will find out locally, at the local level, not at the global level, but at the local level, everything that we find out for this operator will be reflected in corresponding properties of the Manford operator. Okay? So why are we approximating? Well, there is a reason for it. The now attached to this operator, to this approximating operator, and this goes back to the idea of Villa Einstein, there is not only a uh, group structure, but there is a nilpotent group structure. So there is uh, the possibility of developing harmonic analysis. So and let, me, uh, <coughs> let me tell you very quickly so, uh, uh, Frederick, what time, until what time do I go on? Until exhaustion of the audience and mine. Oh, 20 past 12. I think it's time to make a five minutes break because everybody has to have a break at this point. Uh, I, I hope you have recovered a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so I was saying there is a, there is a very uh, simple idea behind uh, this uh, approximation of second order. Uh, uh, let me repeat what I was just saying. So suppose that you have a, a Lie algebra which is generated by 10 commutators, where by commutators of order 1 I call the vector fields. So although they are not officially commutators, let's call them commutators of order 1. So if you have a Lie algebra which is generated by 10 commutators, then in the approximating structure, you look for Taylor expansion of order 10 minus 1, 9, in the coefficients. So since here, for uh, the Manford operator, I have a Lie algebra which is generated by three commutators, then I look for uh, a Taylor expansion of order 2 in the vector fields. Now, uh, th there was a, a correct... Uh, you see, if you look at these vector fields, you may wonder, well, I mean, I said that x has replaced theta, so I was approximating cosine theta. Cosine theta should be approximating by at 0 by 1 minus uh, theta squared over 2, right? Something like that. I don't remember anymore. But uh, uh, so when, it, when we switch to the variable x, I should have here 1 minus x squared over 2. I do. But then I make a simple change of variable in the vector fields, and I get an equivalent family of vector fields. I make the, dis I make the one disappear, and I'm left with this because it's easier to work with. So 
uh, be reassured, if you do the calculation, you will see that you will get a 1 minus x squared over 2. Then there is a small change of variable that turns the 1 minus x squared over 2 into the x squared over 2. Okay. So now we have this uh, uh, family of approximating vector fields for the Manford, and why is that family good? Well, let me first of all write down a set of dilations, so delta lambda x, y, z, t. This is going to be lambda x, lambda to the 4, y, lambda cube, z, and lambda square t. Okay, so lambda here is positive parameter. So I'm endowing R4, which is uh, the underlying vector space for my Lie algebra, with uh, a different uh, family of dilation with respect to the classical one with, with respect to which we are uh, used. We would have lambda x, lambda y, lambda z, lambda t. I'm endowing R4 with a non-isotropic uh, family of dilation. And it's easy to check, it's easy to check that if you take this vector, uh, this operator here, so L, and we uh, take dilation of a function f, this is the family of dilation, then L commutes with dilations according to this formula here. So this is the same property that the classical Laplace equation has with respect to the standard dilation. Laplace's equation is a differential operator of order 2 because when you act on a dilated of a function, you get lambda square times the Laplacian of the function evaluated at the dilated point. And this is exactly the same property. So you see this approximating operator here now has the remarkable property that uh, there is a family of dilations attached to it, okay, with respect to which the operator uh, commutes in that, uh, in that specific way. So L is of order 2. And order here means exactly this formula here. Okay? Well, so we are gained something with respect to Manford. Manford is uh, not nilpotent, does not have dilations, so we put dilation on this approximating uh, operator. But what about the structure of Manford? Manford was invariant with respect to uh, a family of translation. Well, there is a general theory here, and uh, in fact there is a, a very nice a general result of Bonfiglioli and Lanconelli that says that if you have a differential operator with real analytic coefficient, then you can actually always attach to that operator under suitable assumptions on the, on the uh, commutators, you can always attach a, 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 a group structure. And so let me write down the group structure for this operator here, which we can uh, easily compute following the recipe that is di dictated to us by uh, differential geometry. So in differential geometry, the exponential map it plays uh, a fundamental role. And uh, so what I will do next, I will explicitly compute uh, the exponential map. And the group law for L equal to x1 squared plus x0. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> so here I will write, uh, so we have um, x0 is that vector field over there, x1 is the dx, so I will write here x0, x1, and then I will put also the commutators, x2, which is uh, x1, commutator x0 and x3 
which is uh, uh, x1 commutator x2. Okay. So now let me rename these vector fields. So let me rename them. Let me call them uh, uh, y1, y2. Uh, well, I'm sorry. So let me call. So let me uh, rename them in this way. So y1. So x1 goes to y1. And then uh, I rename them in a special way so that I make my computations the, uh, uh, as easy as possible. X0 goes into Y2. Remember, X0 is over there. Where was it? Uh -huh. It's uh, X0 is over there, and that's X1. So I'm going to call X1, Y1, X0, Y2. And then I call uh, uh, X2, I call it Y3. It doesn't matter the order in which I put them because, I mean, I have a Lie algebra which is R4, so I can redistribute them as I wish. I'm just trying to make my life as simple as possible in my computation. And so, and then I have uh, X3 that goes into what I call Y4. So now I have my new vector fields which are these ones. So these are the two vector fields which generate the operator L and I have renamed them, and then I, I renamed the, the commutators like that. Okay, so I want to compute uh, the exponential map. So let's give, given a point u, u1, u2, u3, u4, in R4. I look at the point uh, ui, for me ui means u1, y1, plus u2, y2, plus u3, y3, plus u4, y4. Okay, so if uh, I write explicitly what these things are, so I have u1, and so then I have 1, 0, 0, 0. That is my y1. Remember, y1 was x1. If you look at x1, it's 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so then y2 is x0, so x0 is uh, uh, 0, x squared over 2, x minus 1. So let's write it here, plus u2, and then we have 0, x squared over 2, and then x minus 1, plus y3, now I have uh, the commutator, and uh, if you look at the commutator, it's 0, x, 1, 0. And then plus u4. And then you have the second order commutator, so that's 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay. So this is the point ui. And uh, you can uh, easily find out what this is. So we get uh, u1. Then uh, we get uh, u2, x2, <coughs> x squared over 2, plus uh, u3x, plus u4. Then we have u2x plus u3, and then we have minus u2. Okay? So now, in order to compute the exponential map, we need to solve, uh, so I'm following a little bit what uh, Ludovic has been talking about this morning, so I need to solve uh, a system of ODEs. <coughs> so, now I need to solve, so given a point G, which is X, Y, Z, T, I need to solve uh, the system of all the E's, so gamma 1 prime S equal to U1, and then gamma 1 0 equal to X, gamma 2 prime S equal to whatever I got over there, uh, so this is uh, U2 plus uh, uh, gamma 1 S squared over 2, uh, plus u3, gamma 1s, and then plus u4, gamma 2, 0 equal to y. 
then uh, gamma 3 prime s equal to uh, u2 gamma 1 s plus u3 uh, comes from here. This is gamma 1 s, okay? And then gamma 3 0 equal to z. And finally, gamma 4 prime s equal to minus u2. It's right here, okay? And then uh, gamma 4 0 equals to t. So uh, this is the, uh, the flow associated uh, uh, with that vector field that starts at the point G, at the point X, Y, Z, T. Okay? So this flow can be computed explicitly. I will not <coughs> uh, spend much time in doing that. Okay? So this is, uh, you can uh, explicitly write down the solution of this uh, system of ODEs. I will not annoy everybody with the uh, computation. I will just write the byproduct. So let me write the final product. So the exponential at uh, G, so this is gamma 1. So this is uh, uh, given by a certain formula, which is given by x plus u1. And then I have uh, y plus uh, u2 over 2 multiplied by x squared plus uh, uh, y u1 squared over 3 plus u1x. Then we have plus u3x plus uh, u1, u3 over 2 plus u4. And then finally z plus u3 plus u2x plus y1, y2 over 2 and t minus u2. So this is uh, the little calculation here. You know, if you compute the, the solution in terms of s and then you compute it at s, so this is s equal to 1, that will give you the exponential map. And it's given by this. And then finally, in order to compute the group law, we need to compute the exponential map <coughs> at, uh, at the identity, at 0. And so this is given by, now <coughs> uh, we, we're going to find, so you see, if I put x equal 0 here, y equal 0, and uh, z equal 0, and t equal 0, what I get is the following, u1, then uh, u1 squared u2 over 6, plus u1 u3 over 2, plus u4, and then uh, u3 plus u1 u2 over 2 and then minus u2. Okay, so now uh, at this point we can easily find the group law. So let's uh, look at the inverse. Let's call the log the inverse of the exponential mapping. So the log of v is given by, I leave it to you, to. It's easy to invert these equations, okay, because of the special structure. I know that there are nonlinear terms here, but it's very easy to do the calculation. So find the inverse of this mapping. And the inverse of this mapping is given by this. So the log of v is given by B, v1 minus v4. I'll write it for you and then you can check the calculation. v3 plus uh, v1 v4 over 2, and then finally v2 minus v1 uh, v3 over 2 minus v1 squared v4 over 12. Okay, so it's what it is. So this is the inverse, the log is the inverse of the exponential mapping. And now once we know the log, the inverse, we can actually write the group law. So to introduce the group law now, we, we, let, uh, so we let G prime to be another point. 
x prime, y prime, z prime, and t prime. And then we define the group law by this formula. So this is uh, the exponential of the log of g prime uh, evaluated at g. Okay, and uh, here is what you get. So we get uh, x plus x prime, y plus y prime uh, plus x z prime minus t prime x squared over 2, and uh, z plus z prime uh, minus t prime x, and then finally t plus t prime. So these are calculations that one needs to do at least once to understand, to get a feeling for this thing. So this is the group law. This is the group law in R4. Under which, under which, the two vector fields, uh, the two vector fields x1 and x0, are left translation invariant, and this is a general result. Every time that we have a system of vector fields with real analytic coefficient, which generate the Lie algebra. Uh, which generate the tangent space, you can actually attach a group law. So it's not special of this operator. It's because this operator has real analytic coefficients, and we have seen that uh, the commutators uh, satisfy a certain condition, the finite rank condition. So you can compute always the group law by some general recipe that is dictated to you by uh, differential geometry. And it's easy computations, you know, going through the uh, computation of the solution of uh, the, the flow of the system of vector fields. And then you write the group law, and the group law is this one in this example here. So there is a very specific group law. And now you can define left translations with respect to this group law, of course. So. <coughs> So once you know the group law, you have left translations. So you can define now LG or G prime to be G Composed with G prime, and you can check because I mean this the recipe does give you exactly what you want. You can check that uh, uh, x zero and x one are left invariant. In other words, x j of L G F is equal to L G of x j F j equal zero and one. So these two vector fields, those two vector fields, they commute with the action of uh, this uh, left translation written there. Okay, it's a simple computation. I mean, uh, you just need to check. Uh, you need to compute f at the at the translated over point, and then you need to act with x j. Or you can check this uh, very easily also if you look at the R four. With, uh, so here there is x, y, z, t. You put e1, e2, e3, e4, the standard basis. Then you can check that uh, uh, x1 is, uh, <coughs> is uh, the differential of e1. So if you compute the differential of this mapping, so this is a map, take a point, the point g is fixed, and take the differential with respect to x1. Okay, compute the differential. Uh, that's a, a matrix, a four by four matrix. Act on the vector field on the uh, basis E1, 1, 0, 0, 0. You will get X1, which is the dx. And if you act on the second element of the basis, you will get X0. So if instead you act, you, you can check that X0 
is the differential of LG, the image of the differential of LG of, it, of E2. All right. So, uh, so these are standard calculations. All right. So now, at the end of this business, let me uh, summarize what we have done. So uh, we started with Manford. We started with Manford. We have associated with Manford a, an approximating approximating Lie group, which has one more special structure with respect to Manford. It's a, not only a Lie group, but it's a homogeneous Lie group. What is this Lie group? Is R4 endowed with this operation of left translation and uh, with the dilations which are written here. Okay? From the point of view of the local differential geometric property of the Manford operator, all we need to do is to look at the local differential geometric property of uh, the approximating operator. This approximating operator, as you look here, is an operator of Kolmogorov type. Uh, I am sure that poor, oh no, Kolmogorov is still there. Look at Kolmogorov. So we have uh, uh, the two vector fields were ddx, x ddy minus ddt. Now we have a striking difference. Now we have ddx, but we have x squared ddy plus x ddz minus ddt. So this is a higher order Kolmogorov equation. If this guy was not here, we would have Kolmogorov change the y into z. But we have this guy here. And this guy here makes a life completely different and much more difficult. Mark Katz was the first one to recognize the relevance of that operator in probability. And uh, so these operators are very much studied in probabilities. There is, a, there is a recent work not on that operator, but on another operator that is connected to that, which is uh, due to uh, Cinti Menozzi or Menozzi because he's French. Although I'm Italian, I should call it Menozzi, but uh, in French it's called Menozzi, I, I believe. It's pronounced Menozzi. So it's uh, Cinti, Menozzi, and Polidoro, who have uh, uh, worked on uh, recently on operators, not that one. That one is still uh, uh, joint work with uh, uh, Peter March and uh, Sergio Polidoro, and uh, we're still uh, trying to understand that operator. But, uh, you know, there is some recent uh, very beautiful work by Cinti, Menozzi, and Polidoro on an operator connected to this one. Essentially, it's this one. This is the lifted version of the one that they study. So, uh, so you may want to look at this recent work of Cinti, Menozzi, and Polidoro that uh, explains also the connection between uh, operators of that kind, higher order Kolmogorov operator, and the probability. So the idea here is, uh, as I tried explaining, is to go to a approximating Lie groups with a homogeneous structure. Once you have uh, uh, a Lie group structure, translations, and uh, dilations, then you can develop the tools of harmonic analysis. And these tools have to be intertwined with the differential properties of the operator, and that's a very hard job. I mean, that's the, really the trust of the matter, but uh, <coughs> this we will... Uh, uh, talk about uh, in the subsequent lectures. So all these things here, I want to wrap up now. I think I have five more minutes. Okay, so I want to wrap up. All these ideas of going to a, you know, an approximating structure, which has uh, homogeneity. Remember, I mean, here it's very important to have homogeneity because once you have homogeneity, you have lots of things you can do, okay? So uh, once you go to an approximating structure which has homogeneity, then you are in the realm of uh, a suitable uh, family of differentiable manifolds which are known as uh, uh, stratified nilpotent Lie groups or if you are from the school of Misha Gromov, Carnot groups. 
I think that uh, uh, we have in the audience uh, one person that is not looking at me right now on purpose, uh, who has been uh, uh, given deep contributions to the theory of Carnot groups, and it's uh, Pierre Pansou. So uh, uh, I will uh, uh, start my uh, next lecture discussing, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, a hint into the next lecture. I will start talking about uh, these approximating structures, which are the Carnot groups. This is one example of a Carnot group. I mean, it's the, the Lie group attached to this operator is a Carnot group. So, <coughs> so I want to talk next about Carnot groups. And Carnot groups are also known also known as uh, stratified, stratified, nilpotent Lie groups. So Lie groups are uh, uh, differentiable manifolds in which uh, there is uh, a group operation, and this group operation is moot with respect to the uh, differential to the geometric uh, to the structure of this differentiable manifold. Okay, so there is a group structure, but these groups are also nilpotent, and as you will see, that means that there are dilations. Okay, and once we have these uh, uh, Carnot groups, then we can develop some tools of analysis, and my purpose, my main purpose, since uh, uh, with few exceptions, this is an audience of uh, young people is to throw at you a uh, few open problems which I find very interesting in the subject. So some of them are uh, relatively challenging. Uh, most of them will be relatively challenging, but uh, it's good to have open problems. Uh, open problems is the future. Uh, known theorems is the past, and so it's always good to have open problems. And so I want to discuss a little bit the theory of Carnot groups, uh, and then from there move on to more general things like uh, distances. And then uh, I will uh, uh, try to tell you a little bit about what is known about uh, uh, Sobolev uh, isoperimetric inequalities uh, related to these distances in very general framework. So I hope that uh, you know I will be able to accomplish all of this in this lecture. So it's a little bit of uh, uh, you know a challenging program, but uh, we'll see what we get. I think that it's about time to stop three minutes earlier. Thank you. Thank you.